Hola amigos! Coming up in this episode, and I wonder what the significance is of all those license plates made into a crucifix. 47.5 degrees Celsius is over 117 degrees Fahrenheit. One of them asked me if I had a Melbourne accent, which made me laugh a bit. All the crosses are wooden. And you wouldn't last a minute if you came face to face with him. They found mummified macaws and tropical parrots. Oh no! <laughs> Spoke too soon. It's pretty obvious it has a Coca-Cola theme, but I wonder what the story is here. So I'm in the town of Pica, in the arid north Atacama desert region of Chile. One of Pica's main industries is lemons, which they even export to Europe. It's only possible because there's a series of underwater artesian aqueducts built centuries ago that even filter the water and make it possible to irrigate crops here. Now Pica looks like a dry, dusty, quiet little town and it is in some ways, but the reason I came here is another attraction. Huellas de Dinosaurios, which are dinosaur tracks. The connection with dinosaurs is quite obvious as soon as you walk into the local tourist office and you see these things. They're replicas, of course. But I got some bad news in there. The dinosaur tracks are, are located in a place called Quebrada de Chacarilla, which is over 60 kilometers away. And the last part of the road is along a dry riverbed, which is actually full of water at this moment due to the seasonal rains. So the access road was flooded and it was unfortunately almost impossible to get there. But the tourist officer told me there is another place on the edge of town that's also related to dinosaurs. So I went out there to check it out. It's called Dinosaur Valley. They had statues of a Stegosaurus and a Gigantosaurus. You know, the strange thing is, Gigantosaurus ruled the Earth 50 million years later than Stegosaurus. So it's doubtful whether these two ever actually faced each other. According to that sign, they are life-size replicas and look how huge they are. The mind just boggles when you think that these beasts, they ruled the Earth for well over 100 million years, yet humans have only been on the Earth for Less than 2 million, some people say 300,000 if you talk about Homo sapiens. It's, uh, it's just a fraction of the time that they ruled the Earth. And the evidence is that they only went extinct because a giant asteroid hit the Earth and, and wiped them out. Now that Stegosaurus, he looks pretty fearsome, but he's actually a herbivore. That, but that doesn't mean he's not dangerous. I mean, rhinoceroses are herbivores and a raging bull is a herbivore, but they can still attack you and kill you. <laughs> Look at the spikes on that thing's tail. It's designed to do some serious damage. But if I was given the choice of which one to face, I wouldn't want to face Gigantosaurus. He is a carnivore. You wouldn't last a minute if you came face to face with him. But when it comes to ancient history, Pika not only had these model dinosaurs. In the local history museum, they had this mummified human. He was mummified by natural means. He was buried in the dry sands and it dried him out so quickly that no bacteria or parasites could eat his flesh. Look at his hair. It's done in a turban style. His face was painted red. And he's buried in a blanket that was made from bird feathers. And where did the birds come from? Well, in the same pre-Columbian cemetery near Pica, they found mummified macaws and tropical parrots. The closest tropical jungle to here is in the Beni region on the far side of Bolivia, on the eastern side of the Andes. So that's around about 500 kilometers they had to bring them. It's just amazing to think that these tropical birds were brought by caravan from the jungle over the Altiplano, over high snowy passes down into the desert here and they probably kept them here as pets and, and, and used their feathers for decorations and when they died they were also placed in the grave. Look at the sandals, they look kind of modern looking don't they? Made from llama leather. The ancient people they weren't that much different to us, look they enjoyed music. There's a drum made out of cactus wood and some pan pipes made out of hollow reeds and there's cactus spines that they used for needles for different jobs. There's even a sewing kit, different sized needles in a little hollow cylinder made of cactus wood. This is kind of interesting too. There's an aerial photograph of another local geoglyph. This one has a circle and five blades. 
Back in the hostel, I decided to experiment with different ways of mounting my cameras. I tried mounting my little Pentax um, pocket camera. It can be programmed to take interval like time-lapse photos, but they all turned out blurry and it didn't look very secure either the way it was. Now I thought it's the perfect time to test out my rotating camera idea. So I mounted it on the pole on the 2 RPM electric motor and set off for a test ride. Well, very smooth when the bike's not running. Let's see how it goes when the bike's running. See the lemon groves adjacent there? Ah, seems to work quite well. There's something I didn't notice when I rode in, in the dusk last night. The full name of my lodgings is Las Cabanas de la Tia Flor, which means the cabins of Aunt Flor. <laughs> so Aunt Flor must be the lady that I've been talking to. One thing I have to say about Pika, its street lamps are very elegant. Ah, look there on the right. Chilean McMansions, they've got them as well. <laughs> it's interesting, this town was part of Peru until they lost it in the war with Chile in the War of the Pacific. And as we saw in the museum long before that, in pre-Hispanic times, there was a settlement here of people that would come with their caravans of llamas to rest and replenish and water their, their caravans of llamas. Let's see how it handles a bumpy dirt road. Uh, seems all right. Oh no! <laughs> Spoke too soon. The damn mounting screw must have unwound itself just with the vibrations. Oh dear. Well, it appears to still be working. I'll just put it back on the normal mount on the pole. I wanted to go back along the road I rode in last night because I saw something interesting that I didn't have time to check out. An animeter that was very unusual. However, finding it proved tricky. I was about to turn back when I spotted a flash of red. Aha! That's it. There. Anemeters are not grave markers. Uh, there's no body buried here. What it represents is the place where the body and the spirit separated. The place where someone died, basically. Pretty obvious, it has a Coca-Cola theme, but I wonder what the story is here. There's plastic flowers, there's work boots, a lot of wax from burnt out candles. There's a broken windshield there. There's some of those nighttime reflectors from the center of the road. Cat's eyes, we used to call them in Australia, but these ones are not cat's eyes. And this strange egg-shaped pebble of pumice stone. There's a lot of items of clothing, including baseball caps, looks like a miner's helmet, sunglasses, a high-vis vest. Obviously, this man has a lot of friends and he's very missed. So when I went back to Las Cabanas and talked to Aunt Floor, initially she didn't know what I was talking about till I showed her a photo on the camera. And then she went, oh, that's El Niño de Coca-Cola, which kind of means the Coca-Cola boy. And she said he was killed in an accident with a Coca-Cola delivery truck uh, rolled on him. He was recently married and had a child. But then Aunt Floor started crying, not about the Coca-Cola kid but about her own son. She told me her own son had died in a traffic accident aged just 23, three years ago. He'd just finished university, she said, as she was wiping back the tears. He had his whole life ahead of him. Very sad. Lots of abandoned buildings along this road. The fact that there's trees growing there means there must be some sort of artesian bore water available. Good place to camp, maybe, if I was stuck on the road, but many of them had signs saying they're owned by the military and entry was prohibited. Interesting use of adobe mud bricks there in a herringbone pattern. Another oasis by the look of it. I was already back in town when I noticed the camera had fallen off the pole again. So I had to turn around and go back, hoping that it hadn't been run over and crushed by a truck or something. Then I found it there sitting right in the middle of the road. Luckily the lens wasn't scratched, 
and it did seem to still work, although when I got back and tried it with the remote button, that didn't work anymore. So now I have to turn it on and off manually, which is a pain in the butt, but at least it still works. Why did it fall off? I can only think it was the heat. Melted the glue, as you can see there, it's pulled out of its socket there, the factory glue that is. Because it's so hot here in the middle of the day, in the middle of the summer, in the middle of the tropics, in the middle of the desert. <laughs> as I found out when my boot just ripped a hole in the seat cover, which was just as soft as anything in the midday heat. It often gets over 100 degrees Fahrenheit here and it is scorching hot. Being black too, it absorbs the heat even more. It's so damned hot here, they have an air conditioner for the automatic telemachine booth. <laughs> then to round off my trilogy of bad luck, the clip on my day pack had touched the hot exhaust and melted. I also explored the town a bit. They have this beautiful metal statue of a torchbearer. This guy looks like the local historian, if not a bit eccentric. He had a notice board in his front garden and this painted mural of a mounted conquistador talking to a native Chilean. This sign at the bottom says, the conquistadors stopped here during their arduous trek because they found an oasis without equal. The conquistador he's talking about is almost certainly Pedro de Valdivia. He actually chose to take the more difficult Atacama route in a trek that took five months from Cusco to what is now Santiago because they knew if they took the highland route, there would be pasture for their horses, but they would be attacked every night from all different directions. It's much more populated and there, there were hostile people everywhere. By the way, many years later in a different part of Chile, he was captured by hostile Indians and brutally murdered. This is Pika's recently restored church. A plaque on the front gives thanks to a local mining company for performing the restoration, but it also mentions a law that obligates cultural donations. Mining is a big employer in these parts, but water rights is a very contentious issue. I saw a lot of bulletin boards with political pamphlets questioning the water rights of foreign-owned mining companies who, according to the pamphleteers, uh, get water concessions at a much cheaper rate than they pay in their municipal water rates for their own water. I don't know whether this lady in the red is reading about the water rights on the left or the ladies' night out in a couple of nights here it's going to be International Women's Day and they're going to have a ladies' night for 4,000 Chilean uh, pesos Ladies' night only at one of the nightclubs around here. <laughs>that evening there was a thunderstorm but no rain fell in Pica. Pica only gets 10 millimeters a year rain but you can rest assured that it'll be raining up in the Altiplano and the Bolivian highlands and the water will seep down here eventually. So the next morning I was packed up early and hit the road south to Kalama, a copper mining town. More flat Atacama Pampa. Desolate, dry, not a tree, not a bush, not a cactus. But today I was to see some very interesting things, including three intriguing animitas. The first one was dedicated to someone called Reuben, and it looked fresh, new, very neat and tidy. I wonder what the story is behind that. Note the graffiti painted on the side of the road there. The next one was quite different. It was like a pink doll's house. But there was a crucifix there and a couple of license plates. I don't know why it's pink, but very interesting. Speaking of license plates, what about this one? I could see it from miles back. I thought, what's that in the distance? A cross. But when I got close, the cross was made out of license plates. And look at it. This one's a bit older, a bit more abandoned, a bit more decrepit looking than the previous two. Very sad. And I wonder what the significance is of all those license plates made into a crucifix. Then as I was rounding one of the rare curves along this road, I thought I saw something out of my corner of my eye. I thought, that's not what I think it is, is it? And then I turned around and went back. And yes, it was what I thought it was. Two small dinosaur models. One of them propped up by scaffolding. But that's not all. There was also uh, an animitas there dedicated to a woman. 
and look at that. I'm pretty sure that plastic toy is fashioned after an Australian frill neck lizard. They used to be on our coins in Australia. Uh, what it's doing here, I have no idea. It's just so desolate here, you wonder how people survived. But somehow they did. And there is one thing that's not immediately obvious, um, and that is that there used to be forests here only about you know 200 years ago of trees. I'll talk about why, they're, why they don't exist anymore in a minute. Ah, still 163 kilometers to Kalama. Coming up here is another one of the internal customs quarantine checks. Like I said in the previous episode, there are little agricultural industries in each of these valleys um, and they're isolated by the desert. So that's why they have these quarantine checks. If there's an outbreak of a pest in one valley, they'll stop it here at this border. I don't know if you can notice because it's a bit far away from the, the wide angle lens, but I noticed straight away the tin roof of this building had been damaged, I guess, by high winds. Here's the customs guy coming. He's just, he just had a few questions. I didn't even have to get off the bike. All quick and efficient. There's the old shipping container office. You can never get past these guys. You wouldn't get very far because there's only one road in. Now this is the Kiagua Bridge. Kiagua means moon water, but the river's called the Rio Loa. And it's actually got water in it. Now we're leaving this region crossing into the Antofagasta region. Every time I hear that name, it always sounds very dramatic to me. Antofagasta. <laughs> it's a very dramatic sounding name to my ears. <laughs> Now we entered a zone with more geoglyphs. They weren't quite as dramatic as the ones in Chisa, but they were still pretty interesting nevertheless. Now this is what they call an officina, um, but it's not really an office, it's a nitrate extraction plant. Saltpeter, you call it in English, and it was quite a valuable commodity about a hundred years ago. It was needed for fertilizer, uh, explosives, gunpowder used it, and a host of other uses. And the easiest way to get it in back then was to just to dig it out of the ground here because it comes out like a salt. Whole communities sprung up here, factory towns, and they're often very closely located to each other. They're all connected by railway line that used to take the saltpeter down to the docks for export. And you know, the, the saltpeter and the, the salitre, as they call it in Spanish, that was a big factor in the nitrate wars, which was to do with the War of the Pacific. Now, these company towns must have been huge. Look at the size of the cemeteries. Just look at how many people died here. Now note how this cemetery has a lot of white, like grave markers, and that actually marks it apart from some other cemeteries, which I'll talk about in a minute.
It's deathly silent here. I decided to get off the bike here and uh, refuel from my plastic jerry can. On the bike with the constant breeze and air, it's a dry heat and you, you, you know, you sweat a bit, you feel a bit warm, but you don't, um, you don't cook yourself like you do as soon as I got off the bike and there was no breeze. And I really started to feel it. And man, it was so hot. And look, look at the thermometer on my key ring. And remember, I've got a little electronic thermometer uh, temperature logger in that white plastic box in the front of my motorbike. But look at the temperatures that it's been logging. 47 and a half degrees Celsius is over 117 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh. And remember my thermometer only logs once every 10 minutes. So it probably even went higher than that momentarily at some point between the two logging intervals. Now, is it any wonder that on the maps around here, there's Pampa del Indio Muerto, Plain of the Dead Indian, and Pampa Mirage, which means Mirage Plain. Now, as I was filling up, I saw three Harley Davidsons going north and two of them turned around and came back and they asked, did I need assistance? I said, no, I'm just filling up with gas. I got chatting to them. One of them had a 1500cc Harley Davidson. Uh, they were just guys heading from Ushuaia back up to the United States. And one of them asked me if I had a Melbourne accent, which made me laugh a bit. First time I've ever heard of a Melbourne accent. <laughs> So I only just chatted for a minute and we swapped stickers and uh, they still have a blog up. They made it back to the United States. We just crossed in the middle of the desert and like ships in the night and that was it. <laughs> a short while later I came to another cemetery. But this one was very different to the previous one. You'll note all the crosses are wooden and they're so weathered on most of them you can't even read the name anymore. Uh, this one here, it has a metal plaque, you can make it out. And what about this one here? It's under glass and it's got a paper certificate under it. It's so sad. It tells a story. Even down to the actual minute of the day that the poor woman passed away. Now look at the size of this big saltpeter place. It's huge. Maybe they're the workers' quarters? I don't know. Maybe it was a lot bigger because anything that was made of wood would have been scavenged long ago because wood is a very scarce commodity in this place. And uh, maybe there was a huge wooden shanty town and only the bricks remain because they're not worth the trouble of salvaging. You see that white lump there? That's what they call in Chile caliche, which is a mixture of salt, gypsum and sodium nitrate. But why is this place abandoned and all the other officinas in this area? Well, in 1913, the Germans invented the Haber process, which extracts nitrates from the nitrogen in the atmosphere, and it was much more efficient. And they could do it on a massive industrial scale right there in Germany. It spelled the end of the nitrate industry in the Atacama. And this was one of the industrial processes that allowed Germany to expand and supply its munitions industry in World War I and World War II. But when these mainly British companies abandoned the area, they left a lasting legacy on the environment. In the 1800s, the way they made saltpeter required large amounts of charcoal. And where did they get the charcoal from? They got it from trees that were growing here. And there were scattered trees around here. Some people call them forests. There were groves of them, of Algarobo trees and Tamarugo. They had very deep roots and they were salt resistant. And they more or less were the only thing that could grow around here and they provided shade and fodder for animals. One of the first reports done for the Spanish government by a guy called Antonio O'Brien, who was actually born in Spain, uh, he talks about tamarugos and algarobos forming an impenetrable forest. About 90 years later, a very famous geographer called Antonio Raimondi wrote how he saw lots of evidence of forests, but they were in the process of being cut down and sold to the saltpeter factories because they needed it to make charcoal. It's now recognized that the cutting down of these trees was an ecological disaster that the region is still trying to recover from. The trees were cut down and turned into charcoal, which was then used by the saltpeter factories to extract the nitrates. But Algarobo trees and Tamarugo trees were quite widespread and they provided shelter for animals, food for animals, food for humans. 
you can still buy Alga Marabino syrup. It's like a, a maple syrup, a sweet like sap that's edible. It was the kind of tree that could tolerate high salt. Unfortunately, its value as wood and for charcoal meant these groves of trees were just cut down and incinerated and, and it's going to take a long time before the countryside ever recovers. So the next thing I came to were on either side of the road there were two sort of buildings and buildings are rare in this flat desolate plain. Uh, one said Posada San Lorenzo which uh, Posada is like a lodging house and uh, San Lorenzo is St. Lawrence in English and St. Lawrence in Chile is the patron saint of miners and there's a lot of mining in this area. Before it was saltpeter, now it's copper, gold and all sorts of other minerals. On the other side of the Posada was a Capilla San Lorenzo or a chapel. Um, and you can see there they've erected signs about how it was restored and everything. I can only guess people would come here and give thanks for a miracle or ask for help. Often they write little notes or votives and leave them at these chapels and shrines to particular patron saints. But to me it just looked very sad and desolate. Speaking of miners, this is where I turn off the Pan America and head east towards Kalama which is the town that services Chukikamara, the huge copper mine. And just on the outskirts of town there, I came across this huge tailings spoil heap of, which I guess is waste copper ore that's been processed. Entering Kalama, it was a, like a huge town in the middle of the desert. Um, I saw a couple of hotels, but strangely, they weren't very friendly towards me. I asked at two, and they looked at me as some sort of alien and said they had no vacancies, which I do not believe because you know, you can tell if the car park's full or whatever, or the, all the keys are up in the shelf behind the receptionist. And the receptionist, it was a man, and he just shook his head and like whispered something to, a, to another guy there and said, no, we're not going to accept you. But a bit further on, I found at the Hostal Desierto Florido, a lady that was so happy to have me. She came out and took a photo of me before I unpacked. And she said the only problem was I had to park about a block away at another parking station because there was no room for the bike. But that was all right. I found there were two parking stations just around the corner there and I just parked it in that one there called the San Sebastian Parking Station and I was set for the night. Coming up in the next episode, but don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button, otherwise you might miss it. This copper mine is just huge. It's called the Hand of the Desert and it's in the middle of nowhere.